Grace and peace be to you from God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to this service for First Presbyterian Church here in Pilot Mountain. A few announcements to begin. This Tuesday evening we will continue our Bible study from Philip Yancey's book, The Jesus I Never Knew, beginning with chapter 7. You don't have to have read the chapter to uh, be a part of the discussion. We look forward to welcoming everyone. Our 2021 Spring Edition of the Present Word, starting March 7th, and the next edition of These Days Daily Devotionals for April through June, are available Sundays here at the Lodge, as well as on the altar in the sanctuary, uh, entrance through the side door. Pilot Outreach this, this month are looking for fruits, uh, both canned and dried. If you have any of those, uh, or you have any questions, see Deborah Alford for that. Are there any announcements that I might have missed? <clears throat> if not, would you join me in our call to worship? Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Let Blessed us be the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens, and forgives our sins.
Scripture tells us if we say that we have no sin, we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us join together and confess to both God and to each other in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Redeeming God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart and have not loved our neighbors as we ought. We have strayed from your commandments. Do not remember our sins, but forgive our iniquities, that we may fix our eyes on you and sin no more. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Thanks, Thanks be to God. so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. And our second reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. <clears throat> the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they say to each other, Teach one another, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
The man has been weeping. And why not? Everything around him is in ruins. His home, his neighbors, the city, even the temple. All in ruins. Everything came to be as he was told and as he told the people. So now, what is to happen? What will the Lord do to those who are left? And what will happen to those in exile? Jeremiah had told them to make lives for themselves in Babylon, that they are to settle down, raise gardens, raise children, because they are going to be there a long time, 70 years to be exact. And this was not the news that the people wanted to hear. They were being told by prophets in their land, in Babylon, that they were going to be there only two years. And what was Bummer Man doing telling them that they would be longer? What Jeremiah is telling them is the word of the Lord. And there was no way he could tell them anything else. The word of the Lord burned within him like a fire in his bones. He could no more tell the people that God had said than he could stop breathing on his own. And so he continues to weep. His prophecies show that he was a true prophet because they came true. But wait. There seems to be a new word from the Lord, a word that is different, a word that gives hope to the prophet and hope to those who will be hearing it when he sends the word. It's the word that tells them that God will make all things right and that the time is coming. It may take a while, but the day of redemption is coming. See, chapters 30 and 31 of Jeremiah are known as the Book of Comfort or the Book of Consolation. In these two chapters, there is a word from the Lord that is hopeful and not the doom and gloom of the other words before. It is a word that tells those in Babylon that they will return from their exile and come back to the land from which they were taken. And it is in chapter 31 that we find the ultimate promise. Here are promises for the nation, the people, and the city of Jerusalem. The first is a promise to, that the land of Judah will be restored. The people will return. God will raise them back up and they will raise crops that they had raised before. They will once again be the people of the land of Judah and the people of God. The third promise is that Jerusalem will be restored as well. The city will be rebuilt. And not only that, it will be enlarged to include lands that had not been part of the city before. God also promises that the city will never again be overthrown or the people uprooted from their homes there. Which leaves the second promise. And this is the heart of all three promises. The promise of a new covenant. Now remember that covenants are between two parties and that the two parties are not equal. There is a relationship that is built between the two, and the stronger cares for the weaker. The weaker party never really has anything to offer to the covenant, and that is what is happening here. God is making a new, or in reality, he is renewing a covenant with both Israel and Judah. And to understand why this is significant for God to include both Israel and Judah, one has to remember that Israel and Judah were two rival kingdoms of the same people, the Hebrews or the children of Israel. They had been separated and been antagonistic toward one another until Israel fell to the Assyrians in 722 BCE. Now God is telling Jeremiah that there will be a renewing of the covenant that God had made with all the people. It was not just to be with Judah that this covenant was to be made, but it was to be made with all the children of Israel. And it's not to be like one that was made in Sinai. The covenant had not been broken by God, but by the people. They had worshipped other gods besides God. They had sworn falsely by the name of God. And they had broken all the other stipulations of the covenant that had been established by the God who had led them out of slavery in Egypt. And God had given them second chances. God had told them, one more chance, like a parent tells a naughty child. 
And finally, God had had enough. The people had fallen away, though God had been a husband to them, taking care to provide them with all that they needed and all that they could ever want. But the new or renewed covenant will be different from the one given to the ancestors of those now in exile. This covenant was not to be written on tablets of stone that were in the temple, or in today's language, a courthouse rotunda, to be seen, given its due, and then forgotten. No, this covenant, this law, this teaching, will be written on the inside of the people. It will be inside where the people will know it. They will have it inscribed or written on their hearts. And John Kaltner says this about the heart. Today, the heart is typically seen as merely the center of emotions. But in the Hebrew Bible, the heart it was also viewed as a place of intellectual, ethical, and moral activity. This was where God would be putting the new covenant, in a place where there would be the life of the persons or the people who were part of that covenant. And not only that, it is the place where all life comes for the people. And again, God once claims the people. Once the law is on their heart, they will no longer know other gods, for God will be their God, and they shall be God's people. They will once again be the people of the one who brought them out of slavery and gave them the teachings for them to follow. But they will no longer need to be taught. They will no longer need to exhort the people to know about God, because God and the people will know one another. The people will know God. They will know God personally. And there's a great difference between knowing about God and knowing God. The first is head knowledge of what learns from another or from books. The second is heart knowledge. You see, knowing is a, very, is a word with a very powerful meaning. It is a verb that carries a connotation of profound, personal, and intimate knowledge that comes from only being in a very intimate relationship. Those in the relationship will be committed wholeheartedly to one another in mind, emotion, and will. In, it is in such a relationship that the past is forgotten and sins are forgiven. In other words, there will be a relationship like that of a parent to a child or that of a husband to a wife. They will know each other's thoughts and feelings. They will be as one. And the people will no longer have a hierarchy. No longer will there be those who are serving as intermediaries to the people. For all will know God and be the people of God. They will now know that they are in a covenant with God, who, even when the people broke the covenant again and again and again, but God loved them so much that a new covenant was to be created. So what about this new covenant? Were the glories that were promises, promised fulfilled? Yes and no. The people returned from exile and did renew the covenant with God. Jerusalem was rebuilt and the city boundaries were expanded. But there was still a need for teaching. There were still those who conquered the city, and the people were put under oppression. But the covenant remained. The people were still faithful to God, and they still are today. But does this all mean that Jeremiah was wrong and the prophecy was not fulfilled? No. The people lived and live today in a now and not yet time. A time when fulfillment has been partially fulfilled, partially completed, and where the complete fulfillment comes at the end of the age. You may ask, so what does a covenant with Israel mean to us as Christians today? We see the fulfillment of the covenant in Jesus. But we too are in a moment of now and not yet. You see, we are in the now of salvation, but we still require teaching and we still sin. The not yet. John Golden Gate has this to say about the covenant and its fulfillment. He says, 
The new covenant promises were the new covenant promise was fulfilled soon after Jeremiah's day and fulfilled again in Jesus, but it still awaits fulfillment. In Romans 11, indeed, Paul sees this future promise about forgiveness as due to be fulfilled in the future after the full number of the Gentiles has been gathered in. In other words, it still lies in the future. We are still waiting with the Israelites of Jeremiah's day. We are sometimes discouraged because of this. But Martin Luther King Jr. said that we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. We still need to have God inscribe the law on our hearts so that we will know who God is. Now this is not to say that we have superseded the covenant God gave with Israel. That the new covenant makes the old irrelevant. No. If God would give up the covenant that God had made with the Israelites, then God could surely give up the covenant that was made with us. Instead of Jews and Christians wondering who is in or who is out of the covenant, of whether one covenant is obsolete and the other is better and renewed, let us stand together in awe and grateful thanks to God that God has extended forgiveness and grace to us, that the teachings of God are written upon our hearts, and that because of God and God alone, we are in the new covenant. May we ever remember that grace will reign in the end, and that God will always make good on the covenant that God establishes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. So let us state together what we believe in the creed of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, as we go to the prayers of the people, I ask that you turn to page 6 of your bulletin and look over those who are listed there. I also got word before the service began that Deb Alfred had surgery yesterday and is at home. So keep her in prayer. And that to keep the family of James going in prayer as James Gorn passed this, uh, I believe this morning, from COVID-19. So please keep those in your prayers as well. Are there any prayer requests that we might have missed? Karen. Yes, Pam. Uh, my 12-year-old granddaughter has COVID. Okay. Karen. Parker. Carrington Parker. Carrington Parker. Looks good. All right. <coughs> Any others? If not, let us go now to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you with open hearts that we may lift up our deepest needs and concerns to the one who said that all prayers are known before we even ask, the one who is mighty to save. 
God, we pray for all leaders and people that by the power of your cross, you would drive out all violence, <clears throat> domination, and injustice in our world as you draw us to Christ. We pray for our war ravaged world where there are coups, where there are riots, where there is oppression. We pray that you would teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. We pray for the vocation of the church that we go out and tell the world about our Savior, that our prayers would bear the fruit of action as we hear the cries of pain and suffering of those in need, of those who Jesus said, the least of these. We pray for the poor, the terrified, those who are too much alone, that they may find a home in you as we serve them in your name. And as your son anticipated death on the cross in light of your steadfast love, may all who have died or who are dying be at rest in your eternal care. And now it is through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we glorify you, Almighty God, saying the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see Christ in you. And now may God, whose hand has written the law of love upon your heart, fill you with peace from deep within and the commitment to live in harmony, and the blessing of God who forgives, loves, and calls us home be with you now and always. Amen. <clears throat> 